Good morning and welcome to today's GFM at home. This morning we were also holding our first in-person church family service. But for those of you who are not yet able to come to any of our in-person services, we're going to be continuing our GFM at home throughout this transition period. And within these services, certainly in terms of the message, there's going to be more content. And so certainly in that respect, you will not be missing out. And even if you are able to make it to some of our in-person services, you may want to come and be a part of our GFM at home services to uh, get a little bit more meat, if you like, for the messages. And we hope and pray that these services continue to be a blessing to you throughout this period. Also on Sunday evenings, we're gonna be continuing with our prayer by Zoom apart from the last week in April and the last Sunday in May. And on those weeks, we're going to be having a communion service in church, an in-person communion service. You can book in for those services through the same means as the morning services. Also to mention that it's not too late to contribute to our Easter offering. And so if you're intending to give to that but haven't yet, there's still time to do that. This year we are giving to the Set Free movement who are working against modern day slavery and in particular to the work in Hungary. And then also to mention that we're planning our Roots and Branches course. And so the Roots and Branches course is an opportunity to explore who we are as a church is an introduction to Garstang Free Methodist Church and we also use it as the pathway for those who want to explore membership. It's a three-week course and we're probably going to be running it by Zoom and that's going to be in May and into June. If you're interested in coming along and being a part of that then do get in touch with us. Ben and the team are going to lead us in worship now. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to church this morning. Um, I know quite a lot of you will be, will be actually in the building, uh, which is exciting. Um, I look forward to seeing you all there, but a lot of you will be watching the service online as usual. Um, so that's cool. Uh, hopefully you will be able to get in the building soon. Uh, sure it won't be long before you, you get to see everyone again and I get to see you again, which is great. So I'm just gonna pray before we start and then um, we'll, we'll do some worship. So yeah, Lord, uh, I just pray that no matter where everyone is today, whether they're in the building, whether they're at home, in bed, on the sofa, uh, wherever they are, Lord, that they'll be able to connect with you through the worship, through the talk, Lord. They would uh, hear something from you this morning, Lord, and, and be encouraged. Amen. Amen. So now we'll sing some songs.
This morning for our prayer time, in a sense we're going to have open doors leading us in prayer. Open doors, as many of you will know, work to support persecuted Christians around the world. You know, we need to keep remembering our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering in different places. And there's some great organisations like Open Doors and Release International who provide us with up-to-date information so that we can pray in an informed way. And this morning I'm going to use Open Doors Prayer Guide to pray for Christians in two nations, Myanmar and also North Korea. Firstly, Myanmar. You will have no doubt heard the news about the military coup in Myanmar. The army has intensified its crackdown on protesters with around six to seven hundred people now believed to have been killed. Now for the country's minority Christian population, there continues to be fear, not just for their own safety, but also because they may be forced to to serve in the army. And so let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Myanmar. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would protect your people in Myanmar, that you would protect them from harm and from forced recruitment to the army. Keep them safe, we pray, under the shadow of your wings. Help your children to be strong in their faith and their witness. And we pray that you would provide ways for believers to encourage one another in these days. Lord, use this crisis to draw many people to you. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to the streets of Myanmar and an end to all violence. Intervene so that the military relinquishes its brutal hold on the country. And we ask this in your powerful name. Amen. I also want us to pray for North Korea. North Korea is the top of Open Doors watch list. Persecution of Christians is intense. But now on top of that, there is also a massive food shortage in the nation. Open Doors work with 90,000 North Korean believers to help keep them alive with vital food and aid through safe houses and networks in China, as well as providing Bibles, training through Christian radio broadcasting, and providing shelter and training for North Korean refugees. So let's pray for our brothers and sisters in North Korea. Lord, we pray for the secret believers in North Korea 
that you would continue to strengthen them. We pray that you would provide for their needs. We pray that you would keep them safe. We pray for particular for, in particular for, for believers who are imprisoned. Pray for comfort and strength for them, Lord, we pray. And that even in prison, that they would know your presence and your love. Lord, we thank you for those believers who are risking so much to share your good news with others, even in North Korean prison camps. Lord, we pray that North Korean believers would shine as lights in these dark days. We pray that you would bless the work of open doors and others and give wisdom and discernment to those providing vital aid and fellowship to North Korean believers. Lord, we ask that you would help them to be successful in their work. Lord, we pray for all Christian brothers and sisters around the world who today face persecution. We pray that you would strengthen them. Lord, as they walk the way of the cross, we thank you for the hope of resurrection. And we ask all these prayers in the gracious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Through you I can do anything I can do all things But it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible I'm not gonna live by what I see I'm not gonna live by what I feel Deep down I know that you're here with me I know that you can do anything Through you I can do anything I can do all things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible I believe, I believe I believe, I believe I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe in you.
Good morning. It's great to be with you and to, for us to be able to open up uh, God's Word together. And as perhaps as you're uh, finding your way to our reading this morning, which is taken from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 20, and I'm going to start to read at verse 19. So while you're finding that, let me just uh, explain one or two things. Uh, obviously, last week, if you were able to be with us, that Felix uh, took us through the story of Mary Magdalene on that first Easter morning. Uh, and then next week, Andrew is going to be speaking to us from Luke's Gospel uh, on the disciples' experiences and encounters on the road to Emmaus. Uh, and then in the weeks after that, we're going to be looking at Thomas uh, and then Peter. But this week, we are looking at the disciples uh, and their specific resurrection encounter on the evening of that first Easter Sunday. So if you found your way to John's Gospel, chapter 20, I'm going to read verses 19 to 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Amen. I wonder if you have ever been at the end of something. Now, I don't mean the end of a chocolate bar or a favourite drink or a favourite TV series, you know, or, or being... It, I'm thinking about being at the end of something really major. You know, whether you've been at work or wherever, uh, you know, a department is closing or, or being merged, or they're closing or even selling the business. They are perhaps restructuring uh, with job losses. But being at the end of something major like that can be pretty painful uh, and disheartening. You know, if you haven't been party to it, maybe you've had that experience when you've gone into your favourite shop when it is just sadly about to close down. You know, or maybe in church that you've been party to closing uh, and ceasing uh, a ministry or even, sadly, even closing a church. Now, if you have, that you will know that that final meeting when, you know, there is that ominous tension and almost heaviness in the room as you talk through what you know is the end and what it will mean, you know, to wind things up. Uh, and there is that sort of real tension that there has been so much invested in it. There were so many high hopes. There was so much history. There's so many good times uh, and so much laughter. You know, you're left with those questions. How do you go forward? Do, even do you go forward? But when we go to our reading from Scripture today, we find the disciples, that great, big, mixed-up bunch. You know, meeting perhaps in the same upper room that only days before they'd celebrated the Passover with the Lord. Uh, and maybe they were not just scared. Maybe they knew they had that really final last meeting before they tried to, to slip away. Maybe we just get that peek into the possible winding up meeting of the Jesus of Nazareth for Messiah campaign. There were only one or two dissenting voices, as there always can be. You know, the Gospels record that John believed uh, and Mary may have testified to a meeting with the risen Jesus. But the Gospels record that the disciples held their view, that those reports they considered nonsense. They weren't buying it. This, perhaps for them, was the end. And the, here they were at night, in darkness, which is John's great metaphor for unbelief, in fear and grief. You know, the reality of the resurrection still had not dawned on them with any degree of conviction. The doors were locked and their minds 
were locked by fear and grief and worry and yes, probably some unbelief. But let's be honest, that I'm sure we can own up to some of those uh, faults that run through our lives as they ran through the disciples' lives and hearts and minds. You know, at times those situations, you know, overwhelm us and those questions, those doubts, those fears run through the middle of us. You know, as they had egos and prejudices and their own mistakes, you know, we have those things in us which are accentuated by our fears, by our griefs, by our gloom around us. You know, that in those periods, in those situations, that we can have that tendency to lock ourselves away. When we are overwhelmed by anxiety, worry, uh, or nervousness. It may be so many of us, even now, still have those traits that in that our emotions, in our psyche, ecological sort of spiritual lockdowns and lock-ins. We are still there. But all those bigger things which can cause them maybe are in danger of overshadowing the comfort and the challenge that is there in the good news uh, of Easter. Because the resurrected Jesus brings the most profound comfort for us if you are in and when you are in those situations. You know, for that group of half-hearted believers, of warriors, of sceptics, into that physical, emotional and spiritual gloom of that first Easter evening, the risen Christ appears. And he brings comfort by his presence. It simply records that Jesus came and stood among them. Uh, and then it says, after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The risen Jesus, miraculously, the doors were locked. Physically, he showed them his wounds, was present. He didn't offer uh, advice. He didn't give some sort of booming voice from the clouds, from heaven. He didn't show up showing off. He didn't ask permission, but he was calmly and powerfully appeared in the midst of their gloom and their fear. The risen Christ entered into the middle of it all and he showed them his wounds, the cost that he paid to corroborate that he was who he was, that he was there, not a ghost, not a shadow, he was physically present with them in it. During every moment of our lives, from the very best to the very worst, the risen Christ is with us, that he cares for us, that you will never be in physical, emotional and spiritual gloom alone. In fact, he is never closer to you than when you are in those moments of fear, pain and bewilderment as they were. You know, scripture tells us back in the Old Testament through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 43, he records that when you go through the deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you in your circumstances, maybe in your self-imposed lockdowns or behind your locked front doors. If you are hurting or worried or afraid today, or, or are you asking, who really cares about me? Or, or are you afraid actually that, that no one does? You can rest more easily today knowing that God cares, that he is with us now that you are not alone. The God who bears the marks of his suffering, his sacrifice and love for the world showed up then and he is with us now. So there is his presence but he also brings his peace. 
you know, there is no more need to live in fear and worry. That you only have to go back in John's Gospel to chapter 14 at the Last Supper when he records that same idea. He says, peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You know, he mentions peace twice in our reading uh, and then in later verses that we'll come across in a few weeks he mentions it again but the risen Christ in his presence brings peace it's a, it's a sort of a Hebrew word shalom which means it's not just just resting and being comfortable but it means being life at its best shalom brings wholeness and fullness but that under God's gracious hand the one who had faced the cross and the grave and faced evil and sin and death and all that could throw, it could throw at him. He had come back victorious and therefore he is the only one qualified to offer us this blessing of peace, of wholeness or of completeness. And it's that peace that we can have no matter what and where we are. That Paul records in his letter to the Colossians in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. For God was pleased to give all his fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That we can find peace with God through Jesus' death and his resurrection. To sort of tweak a quote from Corrie ten Boom. When I look at the world, I get distressed. When I look at myself, I get depressed. But when I look at the risen Christ, I find peace. To the sick, to the suffering, to the anxious, to the stressed, to the worried, to the fearful, to the isolated, to the alone. In the midst of the lockdowns and lock-ins of life, the resurrected Christ brings the most profound comfort through his presence and gives us the blessing of his peace. But then there is one other thing that he brings, in a sense, for our comfort. It is our ability with his presence and his peace to praise him. You know, he promised it earlier in John's Gospel in chapter 16, verse 20, where he says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. So on that first Easter Sunday evening, when they had saw, seen the fullness and the reality of his presence, and as I say, not some ghost or, or apparition. It records in verse 20. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. There was only one response by the disciples. And maybe for us now, even in our emotions, in our stresses and our strains that we face and we experience, that we can know the presence, we can know the peace of the risen Jesus. But in the face of our fears and our doubts and our distress, the response can only be praise and joy. But as there is great comfort, so there are also great challenges. As we go through those verses, just that bit further, because there is purpose in this encounter with the risen Jesus. We are not just to sit back. Jesus says in verse 21, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. You know, he's echoing the words that he'd uttered in his prayer before his crucifixion in chapter 17, when he's praying to to the Father, as you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. You know, it is the form of that great commission which appears in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, where he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. You know, the risen Christ doesn't bring reproach to the disciples as failures, but he comes to recommission them. There is a renewed purpose for them. He says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. You see, we have a relational, missional God who has a mission for us. He'd come into the world to complete the Father's purpose. You see, John's Gospel all often speaks of Jesus being sent into the world by the Father to, in chapter 6 and 8 to do his will, to speak his words in numerous places in the Gospel, to perform his works in chapter 4 and 5 and 9, and to win salvation for all who believe in chapter 3. But now, in the death and the resurrection, that work is completed. And so, the, as the Father has sent me, he has saying that he is sending us. The risen Christ is issuing to the disciples and us this recommissioning that we are expected to continue his work. You know, Jesus says in chapter 14 that we're going to do greater work than he has done. In chapter 15, he, he says that we are to testify about him. So we're not locked down and locked in people, but we are the sent out people. A risen Christ in our locked in situation is saying, look, don't be constrained. Don't be confined by your physical or, or emotional states. You have my presence. You have my peace. But if you are part of my family and my father's family, there is a challenge in integral to it. The Father and I am sending you out to your friends, to your family, to your neighbours, to your community and to this town. Not just for now, but as we come out of lockdown and on into the weeks and months and years. That we're called to an agenda of transformation for people and the world. You know, it's like a composer needs an orchestra to bring his score to life. Like an architect needs a, a builder to put those plans into reality. God has chosen us, his people, to work through by the Holy Spirit to take that message and that transformation back out into the world. We have, because of the risen Christ, we have a real purpose. But then there is power to fulfill that purpose. He says in verse 22, and with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, in, in scripture there is that the idea of, of pneuma, the, the Greek word for breath and spirit or ruach being the Hebrew version of it. And if you look at it at crucial points, the spirit brings life. In Genesis chapter 1, the spirit is hovering over the dark mass of the world and creation takes place. In Genesis chapter 2, God breathes life into Adam. In Ezekiel chapter 7, there's that story about the valley of dry bones and they are formed up but with flesh on, but they are still dead till God breathes his spirit into them. He doesn't leave us to fulfil these purposes in our own strength, by our own power, by our own energy. If we did, we know we wouldn't get that far. But an American uh, Methodist minister by the name of E. Stanley Jones said it best. Unless the Holy Spirit fills, the human spirit fails. Uh, and maybe in this extract from John's Gospel, we're talking about a sprinkling of the Holy Spirit uh, and then at Pentecost comes the full saturation. But the Holy Spirit that we're empowered with is not just like a simple little badge to wear to say that we have met the risen Christ. But the Holy Spirit is there to empower us in being sent out. But why? Do we have that purpose and that power? It is to go out and offer 
pardon and peace with God. In verse 23, Jesus says, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. You know, when you take it at face value, it's a really, really challenging uh, few words uh, and a verse. You know, do we really have the authority to forgive or, or, or not to forgive? But when you go and look at a slightly different uh, version uh, of scripture, in the amplified version, it, it brings out the meaning perhaps a little bit better for us, where it records it this way. Jesus says, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven because of their faith. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained and remain unforgiven because of their unbelief. We have a purpose. We have the power to share God's good news, to share his news of grace and mercy, of God's pardon. It's up to them to decide whether to repent and follow or, or, or maybe to, to harden their hearts and to go their own way. But we have that purpose, we have that power that is to share the good news of God's gracious pardon to his world. And in that, there is that great metaphor that we are called to be ambassadors for this ministry of reconciliation of humankind back to God. Paul says it best in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So in our darkest, darkest moments, there is comfort because there is the presence of the risen Christ in the middle of those moments, those times, or those seasons, which brings his blessing of peace, of wholeness, whatever and wherever we may be, which elicits our praise because we know he's conquered evil, fear, sin uh, and death. Uh, and whatever, wherever we are in those moments, physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, we know it's not the defining stage for us. But in those moments too, there is a challenge in meeting the risen Christ because he brings purpose that we are sent out. There is power. We are empowered through the Holy Spirit to offer Jesus' pardon and peace, his promise of shalom, of wholeness, to a sin-stained, broken and hurting world. On that night, they were, and we may be in our everyday lives, confronted, comforted and challenged by the risen Jesus who miraculously appeared. He was the one who escaped death, conquered the grave, left behind the grave clothes uh, and all those spices. The word who was God has now been made the visible God, the one who has brought life and light to the world, the creator who has come to save and heal and restore the world is here. There is only, only one response to his comfort, and to his challenge 
to say, yes, thank you, I'm in, send me. Amen. Ah uh... 
So that brings an end to our service, but just to remind you that next Sunday evening on the 25th, we have an in-person communion service at church, 7 p.m. You can book in for that the same way as you book in for the morning services through the office and through the details that will come up at the end. Thank you for joining us. We hope you have a great week. God bless you.